We're just going to give it another minute and then we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm L'Oreal Lance, your membership and business development director. And I want to welcome you to day two of our mini virtual expo, the transit restart. We hope that you found yesterday's presentations and conversations helpful. On the docket today, we have two content sessions. We'll begin the day with a common sense approach, updating personnel policies and procedures which will offer helpful advice and guidance on how to best support your employees in light of COVID-19. The next session will be communicating transit safety and preparedness to the community. After yesterday's safety session and the mobility session, I think it's clear that everyone wants a little more guidance here. The discussion will focus on how you can best communicate your new safety practices and win back riders trust. We'll conclude this event with four concurrent breakout sessions one for rural transit providers, small urban, NEMT, and specialized. You should have registered for a breakout session when you registered for the event, so that link should be in your inbox. But if it's not, we will be adding all four links to the last session. So be on the lookout during the communication session and you'll see those links in the chat box. As many of you know, I'm very new to CTAA. I joined in November and I was so looking forward to meeting each and every one of you in Louisville, where we should have been last week. It's been an honor working for you all so far and I was excited to have the opportunity to put faces to names. In fact, the first week of March, I was in Kentucky with my colleague Taylor, visiting with seven of our members across the state. The trip was my first look into how smaller systems operate and just how crucial the services they provide are. Just as quickly as that trip ended, I know that this environment will end too. I do want you to know that once communities begin opening up and it becomes safe to travel again, I'll be visiting you just as I did our friends in Kentucky. But for now, this will have to do. As a CTAA member, you will receive exclusive early access to this event slides and presentations, along with all of those little extra nuggets that our presenters have been providing from various um, PowerPoint and Excel files and preparedness plans. We'll have that ready for you. So check back in the coming weeks. We'll be sending a note to let you know when that's ready. We're already putting a plan together of how to make that best available to you. Additionally, if you have any tech questions or questions related to our program throughout the day, please email expo at ctaa.org and we'll help you out as quickly as possible. If you have any questions about your membership or would like to become a member, please never hesitate to reach out to me directly, Lance, L-A-N-C-E, at ctaa.org. I am eager to hear directly from you whether you're a member or a prospective member. Again, thank you so much for joining us and I hope to see you in Louisville in November. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to Karen Souza, CTAA's Human Resource Director and Training and Certification Program Director. Take it away, Karen. Thanks so much, L'Oreal. And with appreciation for your warm introduction to bring us back to day two of our virtual expo. 
I'd like to begin by saying this is common sense approach to updating personnel policies and procedures sec session is all about us being able to have two experts working on the same things you have and looking at their policies and procedures to share their discussion about their approaches and some practical information that we're going to link you to be able to see as well. Please ask any questions of us through the Q&A feature on your box. I also want to let you know that it's really important to be able to have links to these resources on this particular topic of personnel policies and procedures. So as we start, I want to acknowledge that some of the work that's done by small agencies means that you literally are the entire HR department. You don't necessarily have any other staff or others to help you. And that's the example of wearing so many hats. And Lynn Hellegaard, who's joining us as the Executive Director of the Missoula Ravale TMA and Missoula, Montana, is the perfect example of that circumstance. Then some of you are fortunate and you have HR staff, like Josh Baker does as the Deputy CEO at Amtram to support the work that you're doing. Our discussions, at both with Lynn and Josh's perspective, I think is going to give you that whole idea of how to approach this, whatever your circumstance is. Since every agency's HR policies and procedures are customized to meet their particular needs, our discussion today and the resources will be available through the chat room. And in the chat box, we will provide you with a combination of general policy examples and essential information for your consideration. There are 12 policies we're going to be reviewing that are common throughout all agencies and programs today. And that's something that's important to know that you can have links to these additional resources as well. Finally, I'd like to say that Josh, Lynn, and I really work strongly with the Society for Human Resource Management. I would encourage you to all be a member of that organization where it gives you good information and data to support the work that you're considering in the context of COVID-19. So let's go ahead and move forward and recognize as Lynn is joining us, as I said, and Josh as well, that we're going to start with staff communication before we can even look at policies and procedures, it's really critical how we're communicating with our staff because I think we'll all agree, you can't over communicate enough as to what's coming forward, what's gonna be incorporated into your handbook that's new around these policies and procedures, being very transparent. And Lynn and Josh, as they're gonna open up their mics and join us, will also say themselves that it's really critical to survey the staff and see their perspective. So my question, starting with you, Lynn, is have you surveyed your staff about returning to work? And if so, how did you incorporate the leadership and staff perspectives into some of your return to work decisions? I did survey my staff and um, that was very important for me because as a lot of um, nonprofits, the vast majority of my staff fell into that high risk group um, so after our governor issued the stay at home order, we surveyed them, um, have pretty much let them decide whether they need to come into the office to work um, or whether they can work from home successfully. Thanks, Lynn. Josh, what was your perspective in terms of learning um, throughout your organization what your staff and leadership feedback was? Uh, for us, Karen, it, it was just constant communication uh, whether it be the frontline staff and union leadership um, or with our admin staff. Um, and, you know, I think everyone understands this situation is very fluid, especially at the beginning, like Lynn had mentioned. So we just had, I mean, meetings upon meetings, uh, trying to keep up with that information, and just making sure that everyone was on the same page, that idea of cascaded messaging, um, and just trying to be as flexible and transparent as possible at all levels of staff. Thanks, sharing those both, both of those perspectives, I want to let you know in the chat box, there's a staff workplace survey, an example of four of them that are outlined on this slide right now that you can access to learn more about that. I think also when we talk about updating personnel policies and procedures, there are a total, as I mentioned earlier, of 12 of them that we're gonna be looking at briefly today. I'd like to begin by saying that there's a handout on your chat room about communicable diseases policy and infectious disease control policy. 
Those two examples of those policies are something I think all of us would acknowledge that we may not to this point until COVID-19 had any specific policy around this. Perhaps you did within the context, maybe in terms of flu and infection from flu, but communicable diseases and infectious diseases, probably for most of us, are something new that we try to develop. And from the Society of Human Resource Management, which I'll call from now on SHRM, is where you'll see an example of that policy. So when we look at some of these considerations here of the first ones outlined, one through six, and also looking at the other ones that equal the total of 12, my question for you, Josh, is how did you make new practices that have come about during this time get codified into your policies and procedures? How did you approach that? What kind of practical steps or approaches did you take around that? Well, I think it's a great uh, area to talk about, Karen, because th this is, again, is such a moving target that for us, it was really sitting down and trying to prioritize which of these policies are being affected the most with our staff and with our customers. And then from then, you kind of have a game plan. I mean, obviously, we know that's going to change. Um, even though we do have some staff that are regulated to an HR department, it's, it's minimal. Um, and some of us do wear multiple hats. So it's just really, you know, as the, as the targets change, understanding what policies are affected, uh, getting help from, say, your state associations, peer agencies, um, legal advice if you need that from your transit attorneys, and really just prioritizing which ones you're going to attack first to have the most impact with your scenario at the moment. Thanks, Josh. Lynn, your thoughts about this. How did you make new practices get codified into your policies and procedures? How have you approached that? Well, I approached it basically the same way that Josh did. And um, probably just to add that um, I wanted to not make it about COVID, but make it about the broader things so that I didn't have addendum items on my personnel policy, but something that I could incorporate in. As he said, it's really fluid. So, you know, we're looking at the things that are effective and work, um, some of those that don't. Um, also, I would mention that I'm very fortunate. Um, my counties that I work with, they allow me access to their HR and their legal departments. So when we do do our personnel policies, I always have them reviewed by them to make sure that I'm not um, stepping in something I don't want to be stepping in. Thanks, Lynn. That's a great partnership you've developed there. Um, so when I was saying, quote, you're on your own, yes, you're doing the development work, but you've got a great support system there. And that's something to be thankful for. I do want to share with all of you joining us that the good news is um, we don't read off of the PowerPoint slides, so I'll just be bringing them up as we're talking about them. I know you can see those all clearly yourself. But again, one more thought here. These are the six on one page of the updating of personnel policies that we're gonna be talking about with Lynn and Josh, and here's the other six that we'll be talking about today. So reintegrating a workforce and those considerations are really critical, as we know. For many of you, you've already started in what you have been calling and telling me are, are reopening, and some people have said, well, of course, Karen, we didn't completely close, um, but we are, having more staff returning back to us over um, a period of time. So this reintegration of workforce and those kind of considerations, um, there's a handout that I've given around this that's titled Business Insurance to Protect Employers During COVID-19. And what you should look at as a sidebar to policies and procedures when it comes to two major insurance coverages that you'd want to take a view at that handout. Returning back to this topic, you see I put questions up here that uh, Lynn, Josh, and I, uh, over a period of two pages, really thought were critical that you're right now or have been saying to yourself about how I'm going to reintegrate the workforce. So my question that I'll um, bring forward to you, Lynn, is were there any policies that you implemented, kind of, I would almost say the term on the fly as the pandemic began to roll out across this country? And if so, have you currently been providing, I'm gonna take it another level, any type of hazard pay, um, some people call, have called it COVID-19 pay, and incorporated that into your policy at this time due to the circumstance? Um, yeah, I was required to do that when the governor issued his stay at home order. It was like one day you're working, the next day he's telling your whole staff to stay home because they're in the high risk group. Um, 
<clears throat> so yeah, I checked with um, our insurance company, found their response interesting. They said, um, if they're saying that they got COVID at work, um, workers comp is probably going to make them prove that they got it at work, which is gonna be very difficult for them as is the company that insures me will take the same um, approach. So not real optimistic about the insurance um, covering us. So that concerns me. Um, and yes, we, um, because of the CARES money and our DOT, they're allowing me to have those high risk employees basically, you know, paying them while they're staying at home um, if they feel that they need to do that. So that is, is very helpful. Thanks, Lynn. Josh, what are some of your thoughts on this? Were there policies you had to quickly implement? And as well, is there something currently you're providing in terms of pay in some capacity that's in addition to what you normally would do? Yeah, very similar to what Lynn just discussed that, um, like we said, it's such a fluid moving target. Uh, we follow a lot of the CDC and our state regulations um, for recommendations and requirements, uh, providing staff with PPE, um, temperature checks, things like that. Also some things on uh, our system, with, you know, in relation to customer boarding, um, most of the stuff that everyone's doing, not collecting fares, things like that. Um, and really just keeping in mind that you know, we do have a lot of expertise within our industry. However, we're not lawyers, we're not physicians. So when these things arise, that could be related to the COVID-19 pandemic those people are the ones working it out and instructing us how to handle staff and things like that. Uh, very similar to, to Lynn, that, that uh, you know, we do have payroll protection, things like that in place in the event um, someone is exposed or, um, you know, God forbid, would, would come down with the illness. So my last thought is kind of a practical one. Um, how will you communicate to your staff when it comes to really ending this extra special consideration of pay? Have you, have you been thinking about your approach to that. You may have already initially in announcing it and saying we're gonna do this, you may have already communicated it initially at that time. Um, but I'm just wondering how your approach is to something that will at some point, um, I'm not speaking for you, but I'm expecting we'll come to the end of that as well. Josh? Uh, you know, for us, we, it was kind of business as usual anyway. Um, our schedule slightly changed because we do provide some service to our area school districts and college. Um, so the, the rate of pay and things like that wasn't as affected as maybe some of our sister agencies across the country. Um, but the point you were bringing up here is just the communication. Uh, we're, we're having constant discussions um, among the management and making sure that we're going out to staff, make sure they're comfortable, understand the procedures we're putting in place, that there is an issue, that we are working through how they would be paid. And, you know, Because that's, that's huge. When people, especially in this time, um, that we're living in right now, if something happens to their, their, their ways of, of providing for their family, that's a huge stressor. So um, just trying to provide those, that information as consistently as possible can. Thanks, Josh. Anything you want to add to that, Lynn? Um, you know, basically we, we communicate through text. Um, probably when we get close to the end of this quarter, um, I anticipate that we'll have a virtual staff meeting and um, just figure out which, where the agency wants to go. I'm kind of in a unusual situation because I run a van pool program and van pools only run when you have riders, the drivers are all volunteers. So um, from that sense, we have issued um, all the PPE equipment to the van so that everybody's got a face mask if they don't have one, a hand sanitizer, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it kind of educated our drivers on how to work their way through this. Um, so I just, you know, my gut's telling me that the workforce is not going to be the same as it was before, no matter what we do. I agree and understood. Um, when uh, the last really overall review of what we've called the COVID-19 back to work checklist um, is in the outline here, something where we do have a handout in our chat about the COVID-19 literally called back to work checklist. And within that, I know that everyone, all agencies are really trying to make sure step by step that we are covering and not missing anything to get us um, on that step and on that road um, 
and moving forward with that in a positive way. Um, certainly, when it comes to coming back to work, we know this situation raises a number of liability concerns, um, particularly if employees feel they became sick um, to some, in some capacity at work, as you mentioned earlier, Josh. Um, so when I mentioned about auditing general liability and direct D&O insurance plans, my question um, moving from that thought that I just put out is, um, which employees did you decide return to work first and what will your return to work requirements be or have they been in terms of Josh saying in your case, we've been doing things at a certain capacity. So Josh, which employees did you decide if it's not exactly return to work first um, what were your return to work requirements or what are they as you're outlining them now? Uh, for us, again, we were business as usual. We still are. Um, and the only thing that really affected us was schedule wise was that we were able to offer volunteer layoffs uh, over the summer, which that it was by seniority based on our CBA. Um, you know, it, it just in relation to the pandemic, uh, if someone, you know, our temperature checks daily, if someone would have you know, hit the temperature requirement for them to be sent home. Again, that those the what we're looking for is the contact with the physician to let us know. Again, this thing has been so fluid that it was 14 day quarantine. Now it might be three, 10, five, depending on the circumstances. So for us, it's just if there is an event where COVID-19 is involved with a a customer, um, we are really looking for uh, we're supporting our our uh, our sorry our staff supporting our staff on the front end. Uh, with their information about compensation, time off, things like that, um, being very flexible with that, but also just making sure that we're getting the direct physician contact when that person can be released back to work. Lynn, what, have, what have your thoughts been around the decisions to return people back to work and, and you know, what your requirements are and what you were looking at for that? Um, probably the first employees that turn back return back to work for me were the ones that don't fall into that high risk group. Um, the ones that fall into that, um, I'm, you know, I've given them all the CDC um, guidelines on how to determine whether they should come to work. And I've let them make that decision on their own. Um, you know, I do have the ability to take temperatures and that kind of stuff. Um, but there, there's landmines there too. I've read articles where they anticipate lawsuits coming uh, because an employee will sue you saying that the instrument you're using to take their temperature was not calibrated properly and for whatever reason. So, um, you know, it, it's so fluid. It's, it's really hard to feel like you're on top of it. That's the honest way to acknowledge what many people I know are feeling right now and their determination and their, you know, decisions around what they're trying to do, Lynn. That's the reality of that. Um, I'm going to, for a moment, um, have Will Reckley, um, one of my colleagues at, at the association, come forward. There might be some things you're seeing in the Q&A box. Um, why don't I open up that to you, Will? Hi. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Uh, this is actually a great segue. So um, I know Josh just typed an answer to this, but if you want to <laughs> say that out loud so everyone can hear, basically, I guess, <clears throat> if you have any other concerns about temperature checks uh, in particular, I know that's a hot topic. Sure. Um, the, the question was, you know that we that our union have to approve the, the procedure uh, we're very fortunate here at Amtran we've put a lot of work in, in previous decades of developing a very positive culture um, between uh, union and, and management and so this has been a shiny example of having that positive culture and, and very good relationship just like any other family there's going to be disagreements um, but there's a positive professional manner of which to resolve those we've been lockstep um, you know simple conversations um, what the union has wanted, we really, um, realistic measures, I would say, um, that we've really been uh, supportive of each other. And there has been absolutely uh, no disagreements um, on policy, procedure, execution, anything like that. So we, we've been very fortunate. In a difficult time, you need those things to be as seamless as possible. There's other things to worry about. And so I, all of our staff have stepped up and really supported it. Yeah. Well, we're coming forward to our first policy here, telecommuting, what some people call telework. Um, and there's um, really, there's two handouts around that, including an employee telecommuter slash telework agreement, if that's something to reinforce what you have for a policy you've developed around that. Um, but my question 
that I'm going to ask you, Lynn, is for those staff members who currently telework um, and will continue to be eligible for telework, because there, I'm sure there's going to be a policy around that, how are you moving forward with this in terms of how you're looking at this policy? And is it something you're looking to institute um, beyond what's occurred during this time? Well, at this point, we really didn't have anybody teleworking. So, um, you know, I, I'm taking this as an opportunity to sit down with my staff and figure out if, you know, we need to incorporate that into the way we operate. Um, I certainly know that a lot of my van poolers are teleworking and plan to continue to do that. So, um, you know, that's going to have an impact on our workload and probably our staffing levels. Josh, your thoughts on this? Is there something that you would um, instituted or had anyone working within that environment during this time? We have. I'm actually currently one of those staff members that, that do that to care for small children because um, my parents are in my daycare. And so they are in you know that uh, high risk group that Lynn has talked about a lot of her staff are in. Um, and you know, one, one of the things I would say is you know, there's obviously you have to set expectations, realistic expectations about performance, about communication availability. Um, there may be some security measures, whether you're letting people VPN into their, their office computer or they're taking, um, you know, equipment home. Um, you know, that's always a concern. Uh, I would say this, it, our, our agency has been very flexible. Um, understand that there's times where you need to be available, where it's via Zoom or it's via conference call. But also, I would say, you know, understand life is going on. So if you hear a dog bark in the background, it, it happens child comes, I mean, my children come up and they're just off camera <laughs> watching what I'm doing. Um, it, just, just try to be as flexible as possible and just set the expectation up front. And it all depends on your job responsibilities and accountabilities within your system. I think I would add to that, that um, most people are taking the approach and looking this as what for many organizations is a new um, policy in terms of eligibility, that it's not a right, it's not automatic. There are certain requirements and standards around that. Um, and that's outlined in the examples that we've shared with you when you look at those to help you as well and, and uh, considering this or in your consideration of continuing with it going forward in some ways if you choose to do that. Um, when it comes to OSHA and COVID-19, um, there's a handout there about record keeping requirements, which I bullet outlined here in a bullet point here. Not all agencies are required to follow OSHA. Usually it's um, 5307 programs that must follow that. Uh, the infamous Form 300 is what it's known for people who've had to do it before. But it's um, following, of course, with if somebody it becomes ill and it's determined that it's through the workplace. And there's very specific information outlined that OSHA requires as to how to do that. It's very clear, very concise, easy to follow. So that's all I'll mention about OSHA and those that do have to follow those requirements in terms of uh, the guidelines and reporting on that. Um, ADA policies for reasonable accommodation, certainly um, critical for our community in the work that we do. Uh, and when uh, we were discussing handouts around that, there is something about accommodating at-risk workers. And it also ties in with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. Um, and that handout that talks about accommodating at-risk workers leads me to this kind of question that I'll be I'm bringing forward. Josh, could you share with us what you are including in your ADA policy if an employee has tested positive for COVID-19 to certify the employee's fitness for duty? How are you looking at that? What, what does your procedure policy look like at this time? Yeah. Again, for us, um, we, we come back to the point where this is, this is better handled by the professionals that see these things every single day. So it's really the, the communication with our staff members, physicians who are providing direct care. Um, we have policies and, and you know, forms um, all ready to go for those things for fitness for duty. Um, we always provide the physician a, a job description, an up-to-date job description, so that they understand um, their exposure and their responsibility to the physical task that our operators and mechanics may be doing. So in, in that light, we would really follow very similar to the process that we, we already have put in place of just that direct communication with the physician and communicating what the job entails so they understand what they can reach back to. Thanks, Lynn. Your approach about what you're including in your um, look at ADA policy if this situation occurs for an employee? 
Yeah, and you know, I, I would say that my concerns probably fall more on the office administrative staff than on drivers because all of mine are volunteer. Um, but I guess what, what we want to do is accommodating and focusing on results rather than time spent at the desk or hours worked. Um, we also, I guess, were, had some foresight. We set our um, sick leave into a paid time off um, structure so that they can use their um, sick leave, vacation time. Those are all combined so they can use it for whatever they need. Um, so if there aren't funds available like CARE or, um, or CARES Act to help us fund those salaries, um, we'll certainly let them use their paid time off to, to do as much of that as they can. And then we'll just look at, look at other ways that we can help them keep, keep their salaries. Um, I do want to let you all know that one of the resource tools is an ADA compliant what's called pre-pandemic employee survey to determine ahead of time these three questions outlined on this slide. Um, and it meets those requirements for that to be helpful and useful to you in terms of um, as we look to the future and uh, we're looking at our policies and procedures that I think you'll find that helpful for your consideration as well. When it comes to privacy and HIPAA, um, there are actually five handouts we put there. And in all of those, when we're talking about privacy, I think as you look at um, each of those aspects of screening employers, how they screen, and an example of screening procedures and other things that I'm sure all of you have already been looking at, considering looking at CDC guidelines and the resources that you can. I'm just wondering overall, Josh, how are you going to maintain privacy for your employees, you know, when it comes to if someone was determined to become ill with this, not just at work, we know that could be that they're calling in to let you all know, I'm not gonna be able to come in right now because I'm ill. So how have you thought about maintaining privacy for employees? Yeah, I, I think this is a great topic to talk about, Karen, because it's, it's huge. I mean, um, we, we have really taken, um, we take this very seriously every business day. So uh, for us, even being a small organization, um, someone's out, people notice, so it, it's really about minimizing um, or the, the necessary communication on those things. When people call in, we have a, a multi-step procedure if someone's even using FMLA so that you know, a frontline dispatcher doesn't know, you know that that's an FMLA. They don't need to know that's an FMLA. Only so many staff within our agency are going to be privy to that information. Um, you know, we, we've had an instance where we believe a passenger was tested positive. Um, we we uh, contract trace back to see who our staff would have been involved in that. And just, just discreet, um, very private communication, um, limiting that to only the people that need to know. And then the documentation for the, uh, the procedures that we put in place during the pandemic, um, they're stored very, very similar to, um, we would a medical record, um, you know, not exactly, but you know, whether behind lock and key, only so many people have access to it, those types of things. Thanks, Josh. Lynn, what has been your approach to trying to maintain privacy for employees around um, COVID-19? Um, it's been pretty much the same as Josh's, although, you know, I work in a really small office. I only have four employees, so, so they tend to break that privacy barrier on their own. So, um, you know, it, it is what it is. You know, I wanted to add something. Um, one of our members asked us to um, share with them, which, which we do have with the help of some of your peers, an acknowledgement form where they felt they wanted to remind everyone about privacy again, um, to acknowledge the importance of it and what it means. Um, and they wanted a signature around it because they were also a small agency and realized that everyone does know everyone and what's going on pretty much. Um, but they were getting concerned about certain things being discussed openly in, in a way that they realized, they said, this isn't part of HIPAA or anything, Karen. I'm just saying, I want to re-emphasize this again. And can you give us, it's just a couple of sentences. It doesn't do anything, but as they said, try to bring the awareness back. I, I feel my meetings and discussing this is being heard, but it kind of gets forgotten in the moment. 
So I thought something more formal like that. So um, I did not include that as a resource. It just came to my mind as we were talking. So if you need something like that, please let me know. Will, is there other things you've been seeing coming forward as we've been talking about that you'd like to bring a question for us? So yeah, this actually piggybacks really well on that privacy topic. Um, so in, in just in general, have you guys come up with any policies to kind of keep your dispatchers, customer service reps safe if, if a bus driver or a driver of yours has uh, come into contact with someone who has tested positive for COVID? I, I think that comes kind of along the lines of the telecommuting argument and things like that, if anyone has an answer. Sure, sure. Well, um, you know, we have a, we are again a small organization. Our dispatch office um, is extremely tiny. Um, and so we've had to actually practice some social, put some social distancing measures in place even within the office. But um, if they have two supervisors sharing a, an office, which is a hallway that comes right to our director of transportation, and they're basically back to back. So we, we've made some, some physical separation there. We're actually doing some construction based off of that. You know, we knew for a long time was a problem, but this has really brought it to the forefront. Uh, you know, for us, again, that, that it's discrete communication. So we would be alerted to an issue with a staff member or even a customer, like I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, we have some measures in place of how to separate. We can remote dispatch. If we have some property across our street, we can do those things. So we have some things in place where we can, we don't have a lot of space, but we can separate individuals to keep them protected as much as possible and still continue our, our operations as, uh, as normal as, as we can. Thanks, Josh. We're going to move forward to look at overall, when we said it's the policies and procedures we're looking at, employment hiring practices. The reason we pulled this out as well is, is that certainly we recognize everything from drug and alcohol testing to background checks to I-9s that there, the impact that has also um, meant that at times we're not able to get information and data the way we're required to, um, and what are the steps that are required. And at the same time, um, there is a specific class that CTA has that Josh and Lynn in the classroom have trained for us over the years, um, along with myself, but it's available online about hiring and retaining a sustainable driver workforce, and I put a web link down there that I wanted you all to be aware of as well. Um, but when we're looking at hiring, um, the, everything from, as I mentioned, delayed background checks and a policy amendment that you might need to incorporate for times where you cannot meet that standard. Um, so my question um, that I'd like to have Lynn uh, start answering for us is, how, um, how ha or have you had to include new policies into your hiring practices in some capacity because of some of, some of what has occurred at this time? And also that's part one. And the second part is when um, around hiring, what training are you planning and how are you gonna incorporate that into the work that you're doing at this time? Um, well, what I've included in, um, I don't need it right now, but I could see it going forward is doing the virtual, virtual interviews and the procedures around that to see if it's different. Um, Kind of in my mind, um, that falls under our um, reasonable accommodation um, policies. So I didn't have to really beef that up uh, a whole lot. Um, but I would also change it so that we could accept virtual um, or electronic documents. Um, and if I offered them the job, then I would want the hard copy um, originals of those. Um, and then the training that um, probably we're going to include that we we don't normally is the use of the PPP equipment. Um, you know, I, I kind of laugh every time I go to the store and I see people walking with their face masks underneath their nose. Well, that doesn't really do any good. So I think there are people that don't quite understand how they're um, supposed to be used and, you know, just pr protective barriers and um, you know, to me, that falls under safety. Thanks, Lynn. Josh, what are your thoughts about this when we're talking about hiring practices and um, the drug and, all, drug and alcohol testing? And I don't know if either of you have had that problem of access to testing sites during this time. Um, and there is something issued by the FTA around that very specifically. But can you share some of your thoughts around that, Josh? 
Yeah, and as Karen and Lynn know, and you mentioned Karen, th this is to me where it all begins, uh, getting the right people to put in the right seat, not just the person to drive the bus or work on it. Um, you know, a lot of the same things that, that Lynn has talked about, making sure that the policies are updated to include, give you that flexibility to have the virtual interview, um, you know, electronic documentation, and even texting um, prospective employees. Uh, our, our drug and alcohol testing uh, has been a little bit affected. Um, you know, one of the sites that we use for test collection um, just automatically stopped without giving us any notification, um, any respiratory, um, you know, so our breath alcohol. So it's just the documentation of that. We had to scramble to find another site that was approved. Uh, we've done that. Uh, so we've adjusted kind of on the fly, like you mentioned. Um, you know, just, you know, the background checks and things like that, just you know they're going to take time. Just like if you're ordering something from Amazon, that, that two days may not happen. Um, you know, and just handling what you can as efficient as possible, even with limited staff, which I know a lot of us have. Um, and then just being in constant communication with those employees that are looking within your organization and to internally, the people, you know, your director of transportation, your directors of maintenance who, who think they need those people right away. Um, and just, you know, making sure you're communicating where you're at in the process, and handling the things you can as efficiently as possible. Well, I'd like to add to that for a moment, something else in yesterday's safety, the, the specific, uh, sorry, uh, conversation that was had around that in the session yesterday. Um, when it comes to training for drivers, we've decided in the next few weeks, you can look for us. Uh, we're going to do a virtual presentation of how drivers are, um, will be able to provide and secure people in their wheelchairs and at this time. Um, enough of requests came through that we want to demonstrate that, all aspects of approaching a passenger, what you're saying, what you're doing to protect your driver and the passenger themselves. Um, we have to, we all know with wheelchair securement, be very close quarters in terms of what we're doing um, and still trying to maintain that protection and um, all that aspect of it. So to help um, our members, there'll be a webinar around that and how to do that as well. Um, as something we feel would be helpful for our industry too. Um, is there anything else training that you were thinking of, Josh? I meant to ask you that. Yeah, I think, you know, along the lines of what Lynn talked about, the PPE, you know, we take temperature checks every day of every employee as they come in. Uh, we, you have to have training on how to do that. Um, you know, yeah, you have to have backup of the equipment that you're using. We've also taken the time, uh, we have full and part-time staff, so sometimes we go to a summer schedule like we're in now, um, our part-timers might not get that many hours. We have actually taken the past couple months to just revamp our training um, to help get hours, but also to, you know, to stay up on those training elements that we need. And one of those things was really diving into our EAP program that we spent a little bit of time of it during the new hire onboarding process, but we really wanted to give it um, you know, its, its due diligence during this time. So the employee assistance program that you're fortunate to have is one of your benefits. Not everyone, um, not all agencies we know have that, or um, there is certainly a significant cost to that in terms of having it. There's a strong advantage for me mental illness and other things that have come as a result of this, which really leads um, very clearly from what you've discussed, Josh and Lynn, to leave overall. Um, there are many organizations who have a use it or lose it policy that are concerned during this time where no one's been, quote, taking vacation um, and might have a deadline that it um, does not roll over or so many hours do. And I think that's an important part of what organizations definitely are going to, I would expect, be reviewing as to um, how that would work or in Lynn's case saying, what she did before was transition leave to being something combined as sick and annual, or there might be quite a bit coming out differently from that. But specifically when it comes to sick leave, when we were talking about that drivers are having their temperatures tested and scanned in your community, Josh, and the service you provide, and someone does reach that level where their temperature is 100.4 according to the CDC or higher, um, do your plans incorporate that you're allowed to send the person home, ask them to go into quarantine to that level, um, get tested, and do you pay for that? Um, and let, they have to let you know the results. Kind of a little more specifically, how are you approaching that within your environment? Um, I, that would help, I think, to hear that from you. Sure, just a little background for, for us. Um, Full-time employees uh, receive 13 sick um, 
days pay a, a year. So you get two in January, earn another each additional month. Uh, you know, for us, if someone did hit that CDC recommended threshold for temperature, it would be uh, sent home. And then that communication with the doctor, whether they need to be tested based on other symptoms um, that we would cover, um, whether it's through their insurance or, or otherwise, um, you know, and then that communication starts at when, how long they got to be off and when they can come back and that documentation. For us, it's really important, um, you know, some of the leave things you were talking about, Karen and Lynn has mentioned, that we don't want people to exhaust their leave. When this is over, and you know, we don't want to punish people for working extremely hard and then they can't take their week's vacation in October. Um, you know, our general manager, Eric Wolf, has, has been very stout about that since his time here, that people need that break. And so whatever we can do and how flexible we can be within our programs and our policies, we need to be that people can still have the leave they need once this is over, whether it's for mental health or it's for a family vacation or wherever it is. So, um, you know, we, we, have, we are, have discussed about being a little more flexible, you know, whether you can roll over your sick days or get paid for them at the end of the year. Um, so we, we are having those kind of discussions. Lynn, I know working with volunteers, just stepping back for a moment, I have no doubt that volunteer drivers in a van pool program were probably asking practical things about who cleans the van, what do we do, how does that work, you know, in that process in terms of us trying to keep ourselves from, you know, getting exposed or having exposure. Is there anything um, that you wanted to add, I meant to ask you before, in that context um, that you're working on specifically there? Well, you know, we kind of um, have treated our volunteer drivers like our staff. We've been what I call hyper communicating with them. Um, it's they're required to clean the vans, but we've also gotten them the PPE equipment, um, you know, the the sprays, and and given them instructions on how to clean the vans for this um, that we found. Um, we've also um, incorporated that if they feel the vans need to be detailed, that we will pay for a detail on those vans. Um, and then I kind of wanted to comment on what we've incorporated for the mental health. Yes. So we're being flexible in their work hours. So if somebody can only get in to see their therapist from say 10 to 11 um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're letting them change their schedule to accommodate, to accommodate that or use an hour of their PTO if they want to do that. Thanks, Lynn. That's really helpful in terms of what we're all looking at and trying to determine to do the best we can um, and support of all, all of ourselves and our agencies and our staff at this time. I'll stop for a moment and see, Will, is there anything you wanted to bring forward for us for a question that came through for us that you want to share or have us reply to? I think both of our questions kind of help us segue into the workplace safety topic later on, if you wanna wait until then. Yes, thanks, okay, I appreciate that, thanks Will. Um, certainly FMLA um, and uh, leave expansion as it's called, uh, I will mention again these handouts, FML leave expansion and the next slide will be about emergency paid sick leave. Um, and all this um, tying together um, when it comes to a great document, both of them from SHRM, that outlines in easy to understand language what FMLA leave expansion means, means and how to comply with the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, so my question that I'm putting forward is, how have you incorporated the FMLA leave expansion into your current policy? How have you looked at it? How have you seen that? Um, and if you'd share some thoughts with us around that. Do you want to start with us for us, Josh, around your thoughts around that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, we've, we've adopted that into our, FML, our current FML policies. Uh, one big thing we wanted to make sure we got that um, you know, advertised to our staff, uh, making sure that we're answering any questions they may have from that. You know, a, a big thing that we have communicated with our staff is, is that that leave only protects you through the end of the calendar year. Um, so we don't want people panicking, so to speak. Um, you know, there is a, a documented legitimate reason uh, based on the, the COVID-19 conditions. And yes, we, you know, we want to make sure we're taking care of that for you, but that only that addition comes to the calendar year. So we, going back to exhausting leave, we, we want to make sure people are using the leave for the right reason uh, and having their leave available so that we don't get to October 1st and they have nothing left. And now um, someone does get sick. Uh, if there is a second wave, kids go back to school, things like that. 
um, they could be out uh, and there's nothing we can do about pay status, things of that nature. I think the key part here is many small agencies didn't have to cover, sorry, did not have to have FLM, FLMA policies. Um, that's not required, you know, not having 50 employees. Some agencies still decided to do that. I know of many who did, but not everyone has. So some of these aspects that are outlined here are new to some agencies if they're that small who haven't had to do that before. Um, yet this CARES Act does bring this into something that is um, uh, important to connect with understanding that and looking at these documents we've sent as supporting resources. Lynn, did you have anything you wanted to add to, around those thoughts? Um, no, you know, um, and I guess the thing that Josh emphasized and I have really been um, clear on that is that these things will end December 31st. Right. Um, I think in, in our other presentations, I've always said that when I hire someone, I make sure that they understand that we are funded through grants so that the, that situation is always fluid. What I paid you last year, I may not be able to pay you next year if our grants um, you know, are cut significantly. So this kind of falls into that same area for me makes complete sense. And the same thing that you see outlined as part of the same act with the end date of December 31 under what's called the emergency paid sick leave policy aspect of that as well. Um, and the links are there with those easy to understand because for um, everything that we do in support of this and the funding for this for our, our use with our employees, um, I think that the critical part that you're outlining is, is that um, we're doing our best as all of our intentions are to support our staff, to have them feel that sense of reassurance in terms of their pay and when they do need to take leave and that we're doing our best to make sure of that. It might even lead, I can see, to new policy considerations. Some agencies might have employees that say, gosh, I have extra leave. I don't think I need all of it. Is it something I can transfer over to someone who might have a leave? Have you established a pool, a way to objectively allow that to occur? That be, might, might be something you've never had to consider before, um, but it might be something either that your staff bring up to you or you want to consider as something, uh, as a different approach to trying to make sure something's available for everyone um, in a way that Whatever you decide, if you decide to do a policy like that, you just want to make sure that it gives everyone fair access to the pool of hours and how you determine that um, so that there's no kind of bias that might occur. So it's not, it sounds easy in words, but we all know uh, many people have not decided to do that in the past because of they've been concerned of how to objectively evaluate requests for time, you know, and going through a process around that. Is it worth it to research it and do that? Maybe at this time it, it might be because of these circumstances. Um, so I will share that as well. Drug and alcohol policies um, and the DOT guidance for disruptions to the testing that we had mentioned earlier, and also FMSCA and how they're looking at being unable to conduct tests and documenting it. The DOT has right on their website a link and guidance to that for when that does occur in your communities, which Josh put up, put out for himself. It was a little bit of a challenge there initially and the documentation process. So the good news is I think you could, you would knew you could expect the DOT realizes that situation and how to process that and how to note that down. So I think that's enough about said about that. So here we are at workplace safety as Will was saying earlier and a couple questions around that as well. Um, we have a handout, how to handle communicable diseases in the workplace and five basic action steps, practical steps to take around that, that you see the words are highlighted here. So my question is when it comes to workplace safety, and again, yesterday we had a whole entire session around this and there's a lot to discuss, so we don't wanna rush it. But I thought I'd start more generally with what social distancing guidelines have you included in your policies to do the best to reduce, reduce um, disease risk at work? What are those guidelines? What are you outlining? And in practical steps, what are you doing about that beyond what you're sharing in terms of your policies? 
Lynn, do you have some thoughts around that? Um, well, I guess one of the things that we're looking into um, that we may not have is right now with our <clears throat> van pools, we have writer logs where they use the same paper, the same pencil. So we're actually researching touch touchless um, capabilities where you would have an RFID writer in the in the reader in the van where the writers would just clip that card onto their purse, backpack, whatever. So when they pass that reader, it would count them so that we can do away with that. Um, looking at, we already have a touchless time clock. Um, we're looking at touchless trash cans. Um, you know, just pretty much anything that we can do to um, reduce that. We also um, have developed policies on off-site in-person meetings that we have to attend. Wonderful. Thanks, Lynn. Josh, what have been your thoughts about social distancing guidelines and how you're incorporating that, not just into your policies, but into the practical everyday aspect? Sure. You know, one of the first things that we really wanted to make sure we were communicating fact-based information, um, you know, about signs, symptoms, uh, how you can track them. And, and again, that has kind of evolved over the past couple of months. So we're trying to stay up with that as much as possible when communicating with our, our staff. Um, we, we've taken some measures. Uh, we have a very close-knit group, so uh, people would show up work extremely early for their run. Uh, so we've kind of put some parameters on that, how long they can be here. Uh, we've moved a lot of um, our tables out of the break room into uh, one of our bay areas for our buses and, and spread them out about 20 feet apart, uh, only putting one chair, things like that, at, uh, at those tables. Um, you know, again, the temperature checks, we, we uh, installed that, that. They are done by trained supervisors within the dispatch office. Um, and, and no one's communicating the actual temperature of the person. They're looking at it, showing it to the staff member, and then check marking that the actual temperature was taken. And on the bus, uh, probably just like a lot of, uh, of other people are doing, you know, only rear entry and exiting. Um, we have helper buses available uh, during certain times and days of the month. Uh, in case we, we can't maintain um, social distancing on the bus, we have other buses there to take excess ridership, which is, uh, uh, hasn't been an issue so far, but as uh, we've become green here in Pennsylvania, um, we're you know, participating in that, that may be, so. I'm wondering also, you know, when I'm thinking about, um, Josh, do you have a safety committee or, or some, some, something like that? We um, do. Are, are they gathering around this, discussing this, bringing thoughts to you? As you've said, there's so much coming every day, and there will continue to be. We know this isn't this is um, where we are now, <laughs> and we're trying to do our best um, to see what the future might bring, and that takes scientists and others to help us know how to approach these things too. Um, but have they been directly engaged in that, or or is that something you're going to bring forward to them um, in terms of conversations around this too? No, absolutely. Uh, they've been a huge part of that. That really helps us get the temperature of all of our frontline staff um, in a more direct manner, and then provide that peer-to-peer -peer communication when things are, are decided. Um, we, we are, our safety committee is made up of um, operators, mechanics, and administrative staff, uh, and myself um, being involved with drug and alcohol um, in the SMS program, um, safety management systems. So they, they've been key in providing us feedback um, that we can't get maybe directly from every single staff member. And then really, most, most, most importantly, is providing that direct feedback directly to other staff about, now this is actually what we're talking about. This is what that directive means, you know, and just peer-to-peer -peer support. That's, that's so critical. I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Anything, Lynn, you want to share on that? Not really. I, I'm my safety committee along with everything else. Yeah. Um, I do have, um, you know, try and involve the staff um, I, I think buy-in is, is the biggest thing. I can bring out any policies I want, but um, I need their buy-in in order to carry them out. So I think in, involvement is probably the easiest way to do that. Absolutely. Will, there's, you said there were a couple questions around this when we were coming, coming up to this, and would you like to um, share, share that with us? Yes. Yeah, so Josh, I think, actually managed to answer one during uh, his talking about the temperature checks. Um, but the other one is kind of, uh, more related to safety of drivers. So have you guys come up with any policies or what are you telling your drivers about if they run into conflict out in the field around wearing masks or around social distancing, those types of things that can maybe bubble up into conflict points these days? 
We, we have um, installed also some driver shields. We're just working through that process now to protect drivers in the event that, you know, we just are starting to use the, the front portion of the bus. Our, our approach to this is just like any conflict on the bus. We don't, we don't escalate it. We try as best we possibly can to de-escalate. We have training, which is probably like a lot of our other systems do. Um, and, and that, and then if that can't be handled in one reminder or your de-escalation is not working, you're communicating with dispatch and, and we'll send supervisors out or contact police if, if necessary. Um, we are starting to see um, a little more conflict with uh, passenger to passenger. Um, we treat it as if uh, it's almost like a service animal situation. That if someone gets on, we're still requiring masks and destinations. That if they communicate they have a health related issue where they can't wear the mask, we just ask them, we understand, please, when you're close to somebody, please pull it up uh, or pull your shirt up uh, just for that short period of time. Same thing we would do with our, our staff. but. Um, really, we're working to de-escalate those things, and then if we, if we can't, in a very short period of time, contact dispatch, contact um, supervisors, and we'll get out to, to assist the passengers at that point. Do I remember yesterday, Will, I, I know I do, that one of the recommendations that was brought up was, if someone says I cannot wear a mask due to health reasons, that they were going to incorporate into their policy, um, requiring to have a doctor's note saying that's the case, um, and then move forward from there. That very clearly was articulated by one of the agencies saying that. Does that sound familiar from what you said? I'm struggling to recall exactly which one it was, but yeah, I know during our safety session yesterday, we, we talked a lot about this and we also have some resources. We got another question about um, if anyone has put any shields up in minivans particularly. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to speak to any smaller vehicles, but we, we definitely discussed that and have some resources about that from our safety session yesterday. Right. Thanks, Will. Appreciate that. A um, couple of other points here to look at. Um, not everyone we know with the CARES Act looked at Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, uh, for those who don't recognize those uh, initials, um, and expense forgiveness. But if it is something that you applied for through the SBA, Small Business uh, Administration, um, I just wanted to make one comment about PPP and expenses. Um, I'm wondering, first, I don't know that Lynn would have, in terms of the system that she's running, I don't wanna speak for her and she can speak, but um, did either of you decide to apply for the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program? And what, did you what were your considerations in making that decision, number one? Um, and then, you know, anything else you'd like to share around that? For some people I know, who did participate in that? Um, I did not. Um, and it, probably the biggest thing driving my decision is I was a banker for 20 years and dealt with the SBA. <laughs> so I really didn't want to have to deal with the SBA if I didn't have to. And fortunately, the CARES Act covered me, so I was good there. Thanks, Lynn. And Josh, from your perspective. Yeah, very similar to Lynn. You know, CARES Act has been good to us and uh, we, we would handle it in those manner. For those of you, again, who did decide to do that, the handout um, that outlines from the bullet points here about PPP expenses and eligibility for forgiveness, um, I, I would say our finance director at CTA, Rex Knowlton, would say, make sure you're attending every webinar that they keep bringing up about what's the next level of something that ties in with the PPP program and staying on top of it. Uh, there's even new legis information legislatively coming forward that might uh, change it, what would be considered for the better if you did decide to go through um, the requirements for that and enter into it. Service prioritization plans, a really important topic as well, when we looked at all these different 12 points of policies and procedures. I know that Amtran came forward with priorities and determinations and decision points about this. So Josh, I think it'd be very helpful for all of us to know if you can tell us about the factors that led to Amtran's service prioritization plan and um, all aspects of that, I think, would be something very interesting as it is an additional handout in the chat room. Sure, I think just like a lot of other systems, um, you know, we all have maybe a red card that in case of an emergency, uh, whether it's in our community or just on board, 
um, our vehicles or our facilities, we, we have a, a, a set process that, that helps us in those emotional times. Um, you know, another thing that's great about um, you know, our state is our state association is very strong with the PBTA and um, a lot of our agencies are in constant communication with each other. And the service prioritization plan really came from a sister agency of ATA. Uh, we actually attended one of their management retreats uh, late last calendar year. Um, and, and it kind of fell around. Uh, we had a, a small emergency within our community that we were called upon to provide some service to it. And, and our staff did a great job of responding to that um, at a, uh, an older folks residence um, uh, apartment complex. Uh, and so really we, we, you know, we took that, they kind of melded together at the right time for us to say, okay, you know, when these things occur, how can we have a plan in place a little more in depth than just that one-off red card, um, you know, which really is trying to protect us from um, you know, some, some critical decisions in media and things like that, um, that we can say, okay, we hit these thresholds, this triggers this for us. Um, because again, th those situations are emotional. Um, and sometimes they can be overwhelming, just like a lot of the COVID-19 things are. So whether it's a reduction in service or unavailability of staff or just a catastrophic event, um, we have to react quickly and a plan in place with some prior planning procedures, you know, allows you just to go to that document um, and really just act um, based upon what you've already developed before. So for us, it was, it was kind of, um, really uh, fortunate time, we, we, it wasn't a major event, but it, it was an issue that our community needed us and Amtran staff really stepped up. And then you know, in communication with our sister agency, they had some of these things in, in place. Um, they didn't fit us to a T, uh, we're still working through that to develop our own unique process, um, but it which will evolve. And we'll need to make sure we're reviewing um, and we're discussing uh, on an annual basis, but uh, for us, uh, you know, developing those thresholds that are realistic within your environment and then just having a plan in place uh, and a communication mechanism in place, who's going to do what, make sure those roles and responsibilities are clearly communicated um, to make sure that your response to, you know, that disaster, that catastrophic event is as seamless as possible. Thanks, Josh. You know, Lynn, I was thinking, um, that's very helpful. I appreciate that sharing um, with all of us, how you looked at it and what led to that. You know, Ellen, I was thinking in a practical way about van pools with volunteer drivers and it's return to work and about employment transportation um, in terms of that. And I'm sure quite a few people knowing that startups are beginning more and more opening um, and return to work for many people coming forward. How are you looking at um, that kind of support I think it's a combination of factors as to how that operation and that um, goes forward for people to feel comfortable in terms of the service and how they're going to connect with the rest of their colleagues and all that. Did it lead you to have to identify something perhaps or emphasize things differently that you've done before that you're bringing forward to share with the, that community of people who've been using your type of your service um, program? Yeah, and I think it was probably just, you know, passing along all the viable information that we could get about um, how we're keeping those vans safe, you know, making sure that they've got um, the hand sanitizers, um, the face masks, you know, we went so far as to even put out an issue with the hand sanitizer that we didn't want them to leave it in the sun because it could catch fire, you know, so we've just, um, you know, hyper communication um, I think we'll probably, you know, as, as having ridden a van pool, you know that the, the routes and all of that change by who's riding it. Yes. Um, but I think telework is probably going to have the biggest impact on us. So we're probably going to have to spend a lot more time out recruiting drivers and stuff to get all those routes back, back up for the people that want to use them. That makes sense. I didn't know if that even meant perhaps redoing a handbook that you give to drivers in terms of some of this and a re going over or emphasizing of certain points, perhaps. Yeah. Um, not, I mean, I could see that being a realistic um, next step as well for a community that um, has perhaps not uh, read it thoroughly, maybe in a long time or taken it as seriously. I mean, there's, there's some important things I can say as a, a Van Pool 
um, coordinator and driver myself for over a decade, um, that I'm going to make sure we're reemphasizing that with my van as to what we're doing. Yeah, and, and as you know, most most van pullers, um, it's a little bit different than a bus uh, because they know everybody on the van pool. They're all considered each other either friends or family, so to speak. Yep. So that's a little bit easier, I think. But yeah, we we've had to expand our our driver. Um, I call them driver agreements um, to include this stuff as well. I'm wondering then, Will, is there anything else in the questions that have come um, before we, we're coming up close to our wrap up now, but is there anything else you've seen there that you'd like to bring forward and share with us for questions? So I think we've managed to get all of our questions answered. Um, Scott wanted to say one thing about uh, PPP for any of our CTA members who are using it just to avoid you know, double dipping. So if you're paying both your employees via that fund and also FTA funds, you just need to be a little careful there. Um, but other than that, we've got all of our questions answered. Well, super. Then coming up to our wrap up here um, and the questions that we've answered, there's contact information you can see for Josh and for Lynn and myself and how to reach us for any follow up. Um, as a reminder, this session being recorded and also um, questions and information, we'll make sure after Expo that we're sharing that for all of our sessions, including this one. So for wrap up and final thoughts, uh, this is uh, my question for uh, Lynn and Josh. Um, and sharing your final comments about what you see is critical for your organization when it comes to HR policy in the days ahead. What are you looking at? What are you anticipating? What do you see as that really critical, essential priority um, when it comes to policy and procedures? Lynn, could you share your thoughts? Um, yeah, I'd, first off, I'd like to say my email address is wrong. It's oh, MRTMA2. The number two, thank you. Yeah, at montana.com. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, probably the thing that I think is, you know, we talk about this hyper communication and, and getting out all these policies, but we need to be sure that we're explaining the why of the policies. Why are we doing this? Um, also, like I had mentioned before, we're reviewing a lot of innovative um, methodologies. One thing that I stumbled across yesterday is, uh, company called Premier Biotech, and they have, if I'm right, um, and I've got a conference call with them later, and I'll get it to Karen, uh, but they've got an on-site drug and alcohol testing, and you can have them develop these panels for you that, you know, you can use for your pre-employment, um, but it also has the opioid tests there. And it's just with a, a swab that you do so you don't have the invasive collection and stuff that you do when you have to send them to a site to do that. Um, you know, and um, basically, you know, as always, we're looking um, to things that address the agencies and the employees' needs, whether it's mental health, safety, wellness concerns, um, and, and always meeting the government requirements that, that they put on us. Thanks, Lynn. And I, I will gladly take that information if you uh, find that's viable. I'm sure many would be interested in that. Joss, your perspective for your final thoughts about what you see as critical for your organization when it comes to HR policies you're looking in the days ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's just taking a realistic approach. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the past hour, 15 minutes of all the policies, and these aren't even all the policies you're going to have within your agency, um, the ones that we thought would be the most impactful, but they're going to change. They're going to need updated. Uh, don't feel, don't get overwhelmed. Uh, you know, that's going to take some time. Um, you know, leverage your resources, whether it's your legal counsel, your sister agencies, your state associations, us, uh, CTAA, APTA. You, know, you don't have to recreate the wheel. There's a lot of good people who are, are trying to tackle these issues just like you are. Um, and then just stay as positive as you possibly can. You know, we always believe that two things you can control here is your attitude and your effort. You got those two things going for you every day. So um, it's a lot of work. But we're all in it together, and I think after this, we'll come through it um, with, with more in-depth, detailed, stronger policies that are going to help us provide, continue to provide the great services we provide across our country. So, Thank you for that. Um, there's resources here that we also included, um, and we've been sharing throughout this time with COVID-19, our resource page, our buyer's guide, um, best practices, and our blog. Um, so. Thank you very much for coming together around this topic. Lynn, Josh, Will, and the rest of the team for your support. Um, 
excellent resources that Josh and Lynn have, um, and their training and work on this is exceptional. So I know um, we'll do the best to coordinate our answers to anything. I, I hope you don't stump us. We don't want to be, but uh, we're here for you to support you. So thanks, everyone. I'd like to turn this back over um, to the next steps in terms of our next session and our break coming forward um, and to have that uh, as part of the conversation that we share with everyone since we're um, coming to the end of our time together on this topic. Do I have L'Oreal able to come forward for us and join us? You got the next Bex thing, which is Taylor. Oh, hi, Taylor. <laughs> Taylor. <laughs> so much to all four of you. You guys did an absolutely fantastic job. And I think I speak for everyone when I say I learned more than I thought I, I would right now. So thank you so much again for that. Right now, we are going to have a quick break, roughly 15 minutes. And at 1230 Eastern time, we will be holding the communication session. So that session is, the link should already be in your inbox. We sent it out yesterday afternoon. If you don't have it, please email expo at ctaa.org. But for now, we will see you in 15 minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone.